This is one of our merchantmen, laden to the scuppers with a perishable cargo, due to dock in New York day after tomorrow at 0800. Their machinery is set in motion to unload and forward the cargo to its destination. Longshoremen are hired. Trucks are made available. Arrangements are made with the railroads to rush the ship's freight to points inland. Yes, this is one of the ships that put our commerce at the top of the heap in world trade. The only trouble is, this one's off her course line. She won't be in New York at 0800 day after tomorrow. And worst of all, she doesn't even know it. For more than 56 hours, the ship's navigator has not been able to obtain a fix from celestial observations. The weather's been overcast. There's been a heavy blow. His running fix indicates a dead reckoning point here, and the course is set at 308. Actually, the ship is here, and her course should be 315. Yes, for all of man's knowledge and experience, the elements can still delay a ship, throw her off course, cause her to end up miles from her estimated position. In pre-war days, that meant only the loss of time, loss of money, loss of business. But in war, loss of time and groping ships meant much more than that. Delay and error at sea was a danger to victory itself. Peacetime navigation just wasn't good enough for global war. Something had to be done to take the remaining uncertainty out of navigation. Something was done. Something almost miraculous. In 43, in the bad weather illusions, ships began mysteriously to navigate with accuracy in the worst storms. In the Pacific, planes and ships made on the nose rendezvous under what were formerly considered impossible conditions. And simultaneously, in the hazardous North Atlantic, amazing feats of bad weather navigation were performed. A convoy made a perfect landfall following a three-day storm during which none of the usual observations could be taken. Something new in navigation was at work. What was it? It was secret, top secret. One of the war's most precious. Those on the inside, those who knew, used a strange new word to describe it. That word was Loran. Long range navigation. Yes, our huge task forces began to use Loran to get where the fighting was thickest in the quickest possible time. Loran helped the merchant marine get supplies where they were needed most. By the end of 1945, more than 3,000 naval ships were using Loran. 30,000 planes winging toward life and death objectives found their way with the help of Loran. So vital did Loran become to operations in the Pacific that Loran equipment was often left ashore under fire. A chain of Loran stations was set up, lacing the seas with a network of radio lines of position. Yes, Loran shared in the victory. But its story by no means ended with its aid in getting our troops home in the fastest possible time. In fact, a whole new era of usefulness opened for the land. On BJ Day, peacetime shipping fell heir to a heritage worth tens of millions of dollars. This heritage is the Moran system, established by wartime necessity and now available to the mariners of peace. As soon as the wraps of wartime secrecy were stripped from Moran, this modern long-range aid to navigation became at once available to private shipping. Mr. White, let's work together. Can you come in now? Some of the lines are drawing this Moran on their ships. Ed White thinks it might be valuable in our operations. Come, Mr. Gilbert. Good morning. Uh, have you read it? I left it over. I know something about it. You ought to read it, Mr. Peterson. Loran is designed to help you escape us. I'd take a bet that in five years there won't be a decent-sized merchant ship afloat without that equipment. Yes, and we'd be able to hire elevator boys to take our ships across. I suppose there was a time when some skippers found an auxiliary steam because sailors might forget how to handle canvas. I don't get the impression from the booklet that Loran is intended to do away with standard navigation practices. 
and buy bottles to put it on a pearl. Purchase this radar business and now let on. Sure, radar for short range. Radio direction finders up to about 200 miles. Around when you're out in the middle of the ocean. A lot of risks in the shipping business. And I think we owe it to our customers and ourselves to eliminate all of them we can. Suppose one of our ships was foundering in a hurricane. It couldn't give its position within 40 or 50 miles because of the weather. Did you ever hear of a condition like that, Mr. Peterson? I heard of it already. It's very unusual. Fortunately, so is the need for lifeboats. Well, you've got to have them. I tell you what, gentlemen, I think we're talking about something that we don't know very much about. If it's a good thing, we want to put it on our ships. But what do we know about this, Loran? Really? Why don't we have one of the manufacturer's representatives stop in? Why don't we talk to the Coast Guard and get the straight story without any sales talk attached? The Coast Guard did in on this thing from the beginning, and I think they're the ones to help straighten us out. Sure, that's right. What do you say, Pete? Pete, how would you and Ed like to hop down to Washington for a day and check with the people who have most of the information at hand? Well, then. Well, this isn't anything new. The military services have been using it throughout the war. One of the main features of our own gentlemen is that we've got it. A hundred million dollars worth of it counting research and development. Mr. Stewart, I'd like you to bring in the big chart, the one showing the Iran installations. The whole system is at the disposal of private shipping. Any nation, any line, everyone's welcome to use it. That's why we want to look into it. Captain Peterson, Mr. White, the Lieutenant Stewart. Thank you, Lord. Let's see. Thank you, sir. Here's our land system, gentlemen. It's covering most of the transoceanic traffic lanes of the world. And incidentally, these stations are being operated at present by many nations, including Canada, Denmark, and the United Kingdom. Uh, Captain, could you give us a brief explanation of the principles on which Loran works? Why, certainly. Let's say Captain Peterson was on his ship out here. Oh, about a thousand miles out of New York. Now, it's a stormy night, and you haven't been able to obtain a fix for over 48 hours. And let's assume the navigator is skeptical of his dead reckoning position as a result of heavy weather. Now, having no Loran aboard, the only choice is to proceed on your dubious course until weather conditions permit obtaining a new fix by celestial observations. But Captain Peterson has Loran aboard, and here's how it works. Operating 24 hours a day, numerous nations maintain a network of Loran transmitting stations to service the major shipping lanes. There are a pair here, for example, at Sconset and Bodie Island. One is known as the master station, the other as the slave. For a moment, consider these two stations operating as a synchronous pair, simultaneously emitting short pulses of radial energy. Leaving both shore stations simultaneously, a pair of pulses travel out into space, in all directions, at a constant speed, roughly 186,000 miles per second, at a speed of light. Thus, the pulse from the closest station will reach the ship an instant before the pulse from the other station. The Lorraine shipboard gear measures this difference in time of arrival in millions of a second, or microseconds. It simply determines how much longer one pulse takes to reach the ship than the other pulse. Now, this same time interval will be observed at many points within range of the two shore stations. And when connected, these points form an hyperbola known as the Loran line of position to aid the navigator in obtaining a fix, specially prepared Loran tables and charts contain accurately plotted lines of position of the various time differences encountered in a particular area. However, in simultaneous transmission, a ship would not know which station's pulse has been received first. 
And the same time difference could occur along a second line of position, as shown here. Therefore, to make certain that every ship receives a master pulse first, a slave station waits for a predetermined interval before transmitting its own pulse. Remember, we are still thinking in terms of microseconds. Now, from the time difference received at any given position, the Loran receiver automatically subtracts the known slave station delay. The resulting time difference as read at the ship will occur on one and only one Loran line of position. Having one line of position, we then obtain readings from another pair of stations. An accurate fix is established at the intersection of the two lines of position. Well, that's the story. Only the line works a few million times faster than that. And it's almost automatic. Thanks, Captain. Well, Pete, what do you think? What's the cost to the company? Only the cost of the land ship or receivers. Well, you might consider it about the cost of a good marine radio receiver installation. The transmitting station equipment was provided for wartime use. Let me ask you a question, Captain. Why is the Coast Guard so interested in Loran for merchant ships? Well, the primary mission of the Coast Guard concerns the safety of life and property at sea. This means, first, prevention of sea accidents, and second, assistance in distress cases. Well, I think Lieutenant Stewart here can tell you why we'd like to see Loran on commercial vessels. Lieutenant Stewart was navigator on the Cutter Campbell operating off Hatteras. Now, it wasn't always so easy for them to locate ships in trouble. And that's right, sir. Uh, that was before the war. Of course, we didn't have Loran then, and neither did the ships. Almost every distress call we ever got, where the weather was bad for two or three days running, we'd miss the distress vessel by anywhere from 10 to 50 miles. And as a result, sometimes spent days searching for it. Well, that's our interest in seeing you people get Loran. It would enable us to render assistance more promptly and make our job much easier. Yes, sir. Every day navigating, you hit him on the nose every time with this thing? Well, under favorable conditions, even at times when other means of navigation fail completely, you can obtain a fix within a half mile. Under unfavorable conditions, errors will usually not exceed five to ten miles. Yes, when the stars are out, you know they're where they should be. There's no chance of mechanical failure. <laughs> Unfortunately, the stars are not visible during bad weather. When they're needed most, I think Captain Peterson is worrying about the art of uh, celestial navigation being lost. Fifty years from now, who knows what we'll have. But right now, ships equipped with Loran are using it mostly as a supplementary aid to navigation. For example, Loran lines of position can be crossed with sun and star lines, soundings and radar range circles to provide a fix. You see, Pete? Now, Captain, one more consideration. Is the equipment available? Is it standardized? The answer to both your questions is yes. Already, the larger manufacturers of electronic equipment are turning out standardized models in volume, indicating their expectation of Loran's general use on ships and planes. These manufacturers have even set up schools where complete courses are given in operating the equipment. Two or three days at one of these schools is all the navigator needs to learn how to use his Loran. You're not getting into anything like the lengthy navigation courses which must be mastered before one becomes a competent celestial navigator. Installing the shipboard line equipment is comparatively simple and can be accomplished in a matter of hours. New and greatly improved direct reading receiver indicators make Loran even simpler to operate now than in wartime. The ship's navigation officer, as with other aids to navigation, is the one who makes the Loran observation. Having learned the basic principles of Loran, it is now merely a matter of practice to become a capable and reliable operator under any conditions encountered. Loran is not intended to replace other means of navigation, 
but it is an important new supplement to the tried and true system. All, together, make navigation safer and more reliable than ever before in history. There she goes, and behind her now is a vast organization of men and equipment devoted to one major task, to help her get where she's going with safety and a minimum of lost motion. Here's what's behind her. This Loran station, manned by trained personnel, is one of a worldwide chain. These stations provide long-range navigation signals up to 750 miles by day and 1,400 miles by night. So precise is the Loran timer that a pocket watch of the same accuracy would run five to ten years without losing or gaining a single second. Should mechanical trouble develop, a warning blinker signal is immediately transmitted and continued until the duplicate standby equipment is switched in and synchronization is restored. This is the equipment and constant service behind every ship that sails forth with Loran to guide it to a safe and scheduled landfall. These same Loran stations serve 300 mile an hour airliners on their day and night flights over the oceans of the world. Loran stations are operating along both coasts of North America, along the great circle routes of the North Atlantic and Pacific. Accurate, efficient, reliable, working day and night. Loran has ushered in a new age of navigation. The age of electronics has given mariners of the world a new magic, born of war, for the boon to peace, to tell them swiftly and surely what they most need to know when they need to know it most. And the name of the new magic for mariners is Loran.